Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by Tanium. At Tanium, they know that in a distributed world, both business operations and agencies' missions increasingly begin at the endpoint. Tanium provides unified endpoint management and security for the most demanding IT environments. Their approach decentralizes data collection, aggregation, and distribution down to the endpoint, delivering transformational scale, speed, and reliability across your distributed workforce. Learn why the Department of Defense and half of the Fortune 100 trust Tanium at Tanium.com. Microsoft researchers detail the lengths to which Solara gay threat actors went to stay undetected and establish persistence. Lucky Boy malvertising is described. Business email compromise is reconnaissance technique. More reminders about the risks that accompany remote work. Ben Yellen looks at cyber policy issues facing the Biden administration. Rick Howard speaks with Frank Duff from MITRE on their attack evaluation program. And good riddance to the Joker's stash. Here's hoping. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, January 21st, 2021. Microsoft yesterday offered more details on how the Solaragate threat actors worked and why their infiltration of their targets was as quietly effective as it proved to be. It had, for example, been unclear how the handover from the Sunburst DLL backdoor to the Cobalt Strike loader was accomplished, and Microsoft details how the threat actor obscured that handover as they accomplished it. Redmond's assessment of the Solarigate crew is that their, quote, skilled campaign operators who carefully planned and executed the attack, remaining elusive while maintaining persistence, end quote, accomplished in operational security and adept at minimizing their footprint. In looking at the Solarigate operation, Microsoft identified six techniques the Solarigate operators used to escape detection. They're worth reviewing. First, they took care to avoid putting up the same indicators for each compromised host. Every Cobalt Strike DLL implant was designed to be unique to each affected machine. One of the tells the threat actors scrupulously avoided was the reuse of folder name, file name, export function names, C2 domain and IP, HTTP requests, timestamp, file metadata, config, and child process launched. They also varied such non-executables as WMI persistence filter name, WMI filter query, passwords used for 7-zip archives, and names of output log files. That, Microsoft says, took a lot of effort, and a whole lot more effort than the typical threat group finds it worth expending. Second, the Solorigate actors took care to camouflage themselves to blend into targets' environments. The tools and binaries they used were named and put in folders that appeared to belong in the affected machine. They mimicked existing legitimate files and programs that they found in the victim's environment. Third, before they ran their hands-on keyboard activity, which would raise the risk of detection, the threat actors disabled event logging using audit poll. They re-enabled logging once they were finished. Similarly, they installed special firewall rules before they ran unavoidably noisy network reconnaissance. The rules were designed to minimize outgoing packets for certain protocols. Once the reconnaissance was complete, they systematically removed those firewall rules. It's also noteworthy, Microsoft says, that the Solarigate operators executed lateral movement only after careful preparation. They began by enumerating any remote processes and services running on the target host, and they moved laterally across the network only after they disabled security services that might detect them. Finally, Microsoft believes they time-stomped the timestamps of various artifacts, altered them, that is, and also used professional wiping procedures and tools with a view to complicate the defender's problem of finding and eliminating the DLL implants from the affected systems. So, whoever they were, and the smart money is still on Russian intelligence services, the Solarigate threat actors showed rare patience, sophistication, and attention to detail far beyond what organized crime normally attempts. 
Security Week describes research by Media Trust into a cross-platform malvertising campaign, Lucky Boy, that's afflicting users of iOS, Android, and Xbox systems. It checks for blockers, test environments, and debuggers before it runs. Once it does execute, Lucky Boy uses a tracking pixel to redirect the victim to malicious sites like phishing pages or bogus software updates. The campaign, which surfaced last week, appears to be in its early testing phases. It's another instance of malware using relatively complicated means of obfuscating itself. It's not as complex as what the SolarGate operators used, but even criminals try to stay undetected. Proofpoint has found a business email compromise campaign that uses Google Forms to bypass keyword-based email content filters. The researchers see the campaign as a hybrid, combining social engineering with exploitation of the scale and legitimacy of Google services. The messages themselves are relatively primitive, with the poor idiomatic control so often found in criminal communications, but Proofpoint suspects they'll find takers nonetheless. The researchers think that the BEC effort represents an email reconnaissance campaign to enable target selection for undetermined follow-on threat activity. The increase in remote work during the pandemic has, of course, greatly increased most organizations' attack surface. Yes, yes, we know, this is old news, but bear with us. Or rather, bear with Wandera, whose 2021 cloud security report has some interesting findings on the extent to which the criminal underworld has embraced the opportunities remote work affords. Your remote work, not theirs. Oh, and remote workers could behave better, too. Wandera says that accessing what they primly call inappropriate content, and we leave it as an exercise for the listener what counts as inappropriate content, has at least doubled since the onset of the pandemic. Did you know that websites in the adult, gambling, extreme, and illegal content categories are more likely to leak data than nice sites? Well, they are, you know. Avoid the near occasion of compromise. And finally, remember the Joker's Stash, the online Carter forum that took its lumps from law enforcement during 2020 but succeeded in resisting complete eradication? Security Week reported in December that the FBI and Interpol had seized a number of the illicit market's blockchain domains, which put a big dent but not a fatal hole in their operations. The same publication now reports that Joker's stash has said it's going out of business. In an all-good-bad-things-must-come-to-an-end mood, the Souks proprietors have posted an announcement to some of its many unaffected domains that they're off to what they call a well-deserved retirement. It's time for us to leave forever, they say, and they plan to wipe all their stuff for good on February 15th. That's Washington's birthday, but we cannot tell a lie. We have no idea if that holiday has any importance for the Joker. The hoods behind Joker's stash say they intend to settle all their accounts in the criminal-to-criminal market before they go dark, but we'll see. Other such services have simply absconded. It also remains to be seen how real the promised retirement proves to be. We hope we'll all be able to say, good riddance. And now, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. There's a reason more than half of today's ransomware victims end up paying the ransom. Cyber criminals have become thoughtful taking time to maximize your organization's potential damage and their payoffs. After achieving root access, the bad guys explore your network, reading email, finding data troves, and once they know you, they craft a plan to cause the most panic, pain, and operational disruption. Ransomware has gone nuclear. The folks at Know Before have an upcoming webinar that'll get you up to speed on ransomware. In this webinar, you'll find out why data backups, even offline backups, won't save you, why ransomware isn't your real problem, and how your end users can become your best last line of defense. Go to knowbefore.com slash ransom to learn more about the webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E numeral four dot com slash R-A-N-S-O-M. And we thank No Before for sponsoring our show. Shh. 
MITRE describes their attack framework as a globally accessible knowledge base of adversary tactics and techniques based on real-world observations. That sounds about right. To help bridge the gap between that knowledge base and how it may apply to defenders in everyday use, MITRE provides attack evaluations. Our own Rick Howard files this report. The MITRE attack framework is the most complete open-source collection of cyber adversary activity in the world. Can you hear me okay? I, I can. I asked Frank Duff, the director of the MITRE attack evaluation program, to explain what attack is Absolutely. and how it got its start. MITRE attack is a knowledge base of known adversary behaviors. Um, the, the concept there is that to better defend our networks, we have to understand what adversaries are actually doing on them. So MITRE attack was generated from a research project uh, many years ago, meaning five to eight, um, depending on, on, on when you consider conception. But we started, started the effort as uh, a way of making it so we could communicate more effectively between our defenders and the people that were testing out our research hypotheses, um, the red team, as it were. Um, and so we needed a way to explain what the red team was doing such that the defenders could understand it and create better defenses, better analytics, uh, better censoring. Since then, that initial research has grown into a full-blown wiki. The question that immediately comes up then is how do you convert the MITRE attack list into prevention controls for your security stack? Frank says one way to do it is with threat emulation. Let's pick a adversary that is of interest to us for whatever reason, figure out which techniques they use, how they use them, so, so their uh, modus operandi, right? Like their, their pacing that they use, um, the types of tooling that they use to do it. Still not focusing on specifically their malware, but what, how do they use these techniques? What behaviors are they generating? What data are they creating on these endpoints that would further detection and protection capabilities? The MITRE attack evaluation program that Frank runs is not a consumer report style analysis of a cybersecurity product. It's strictly a thumbs up and thumbs down scorecard on how each participating vendor detects the TTPs of a specific adversary attack sequence. So we'll allow any vendor that wants to participate, you can uh, uh, apply to be participated. Uh, the vendors pay for it. Um, but so you sign up, you want to do it. We don't care about your market segment as long as we can do the yeah. same methodology against you. We're doing a threat informed methodology. You can say how you detect in your own way. We don't declare winners, we don't rank, we don't rate. We don't so far, the evaluation program has considered two adversary groups. APT29, the Russian adversary group behind the 2016 DNC hacks, and APT3, the Chinese adversary group behind the breaches at Equifax, Anthem, and OPM. The group they are working on right now is FIN7, the cybercrime group that has primarily targeted the U.S. retail, restaurant, and hospitality sectors since mid-2015. But here's the takeaway. Encourage your vendors to participate in the MITRE Attack Evaluation Program. It costs you nothing, makes their products better, and makes the entire security community more safe. That's the CyberWire's Rick Howard. And now a message from our sponsor, Cyber Reason. If you're a defender fighting to protect your organization from the dark forces of cyber attackers, it might seem attackers have the advantage. To win, they only need to be successful once. As a cyber defender, you must be successful in ending attacks every single time. Cyber Reason reverses the attacker's advantage. They put the power back in your hands. Their future-ready attack platform gives defenders the wisdom to uncover, understand, and piece together multiple threats and the precision focus to end cyber attacks instantly on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Wherever your organization is being threatened, Cyber Reason is ready to win the battle against cyber attacks. With you and for you. Join them and the world's leading companies. Together, we are the defenders. Cyber Reason. End cyber attacks. From endpoints to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com. And joining me once again is Ben Yellen. He's from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security and also my co-host on the Caveat Podcast. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. 
Uh, interesting story from the folks over at CyberScoop. Uh, this is uh, titled The Big Cyber Issues Joe Biden Will Face His First Day in Office. Uh, of course, uh, recently inaugurated uh, President Biden uh, is uh, is hard at work <laughs> underway with his new administration, uh, but he's got some challenges ahead of us here. What are some of the things that uh, the folks at CyberScoop have laid out here, Ben? So he certainly has no shortage of, of problems to deal with. Uh, civil unrest, uh, the you know <laughs> continuing pandemic, everything else that's going on in this country, the economy. Uh, but there are a lot of cybersecurity issues that he's going to have to address, and he's going to have to address rather quickly. The first is responding to the solar winds mess. We're still in the early stages of understanding this hack and, uh, you know, the extent to which it's not only infected our government's network and systems, but has also seeped into the private sector. President Biden vowed to get to the bottom of the hack, which I think most public policy experts think was the work of Russian operatives uh, who were able to infiltrate these uh, networks at, at federal agencies. Uh, So that's really going to be his first order of business, getting to the bottom of this attack and then deciding, Mm -hmm. you know, whether to respond with uh, similar force, so to speak, whether, Mm -hmm. you know, we are going to prioritize offensive cybersecurity operation or cyber operations uh, against our foreign adversaries. Um, If, you know, President Biden concludes based on all the information available that the Russian government and its minions are responsible for this attack, then that really is going to have a big impact on, um, you know, what the president is going to do in his first year. And there's this quote from uh, the incoming national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, saying, you know, we're not going to tell you exactly what we're going to do, um, but there will be costs for attacks like this. So whether that's offensive cyber operations or sanctions or something else, we don't know. But they are yeah. telegraphing they're, they're going to do something about that. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the Biden administration is going to have to make a decision on offensive cyber operations in general. Uh, That's something that uh, the Trump administration prioritized. Um, They uh, expressed eagerness to use cyber operations. You know, I I think everybody, there's sort of a widespread agreement that we need to invest more in protecting our own networks. But the extent to which, you know, we're going to engage in offensive cyber operations I think is a, a policy question that's still uh, at large. Mm. Um, and then, you know, just generally trying to curb destructive hacking. Uh, this article mentions, you know, a number of the most prominent hacks and, and how much damage they've done to private sector industries, uh, starting from the alleged North Korean two, 2014 attack of Sony Pictures, um, the Russian Natpetya assault in 2017, You know, this is uh, something that has to be uh, an all hands on deck effort. Uh, It can't be done solely domestically. Part of it has to be done with our international partners. Um, And, you know, that's why uh, the Obama administration had added the cybersecurity coordinator position at the State Department uh, Mm. so that they could have a voice in international relations. The Trump administration disbanded that position a, a couple of years later. So really, there there are a lot of things on the table. You know, I think President Biden would have probably preferred not to be facing, among other emergencies, the impacts of the solar winds attack, which I don't think you know we we've really gotten to the bottom of. Um, yeah. But uh, them's the breaks, as they say, and and you yeah. know, this might consume the early days of his administration. Yeah, and it really points to uh, how, as you say, it's a global situation here and that um, even working on our relationships with our allies, which have certainly been strained over the past few years, is is going to be a key component of our safety even in the cyber realm. Absolutely. Uh, and these relationships are going to take a while to rebuild. Uh, it's not necessarily one of those forgive and forget where – we pretend that the last four years didn't happen. I mean, we really do have frayed alliances, particularly with our NATO allies. Um, and, but we have these these shared interests. You know, our adversaries are the adversaries of those uh, in the European Union, other Western democracies. Uh, and if they try to attack us, they're going to try to attack some of these other countries as well. So that just you know enhances the importance of diplomacy. Right, right. Well, of course, all of these issues pale in comparison to the fact that evidently 
President Biden has a Peloton bike that he the wants Peloton, to use. Peloton, no! <laughs> it's, all, yeah. it's all going to come crashing down because uh, the, 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 uh, the, the president has an IoT-connected uh, exercise bike, right? The, the exercise bike is going to doom all of us. The country <laughs> is just going to collapse because of that Peloton in the residential area of the White House. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I will just say, for those people who are potentially worried about cybersecurity concerns relating to this IoT device, They'll figure it out. He has access to <laughs> some of the foremost cybersecurity experts in the country. Right. It's, right. it's, it's not really going to be a problem. And in response to the New York Times, who say, you know, they say this cuts against Biden's working class image, a lot of people have Pelotons. And <laughs> I, I, I don't personally, uh, but I know yeah. a lot of people who do. And right. <laughs> I, I, I think we're all going to be fine. Yeah, this too shall pass. Yep. All right. Well, Ben Yellen, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks to the sponsors who make the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, providing the foundational knowledge to meet the growing need for highly skilled information assurance and privacy professionals. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. And for professionals and cybersecurity leaders who want to stay abreast of this rapidly evolving field, sign up for Cyberwire Pro. It'll save you time and keep you informed. You can't beat the feeling. Listen for us on your Alexa smart speaker, too. The Cyberwire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. In the turbulent security space that's filled with overhyped solutions and empty promises, Red Canary breaks through with radical transparency and a laser focus on delivering outcomes. They are relentless in their vision to create a world where every organization can achieve its mission without fear of cyber attacks. Great security operations depend on detection and response capabilities that reduce the time attackers can spend in your network. That means having detailed visibility and broad detection in the places where they operate, your endpoints, your network, and your cloud environments. Red Canary is passionate about improving outcomes, not just for their customers, but for the entire community. You see that passion in the content they deliver and via their open source projects like Atomic Red Team. At the end of the day, Red Canary is your security ally. See what it's like to have a partner in the fight. Visit redcanary.com today. And we thank Red Canary for sponsoring our show. 